Okay guys, like I said, we're going to do test taking strategies today. I want to make sure that all nursing students understand that they should be looking at the NCLEX RN test plan on the NCSBN website. So if you've not done this yet, make sure that you look at it, download it, and go through it often while you're in nursing school. Okay, just some general info about the NCLEX RN exam. And I did take this information off the NCSBN website. One, you have six hours to take the test. You can get a minimal of 75 questions or all the way up to 265. It's a CAT test. That means it's a computer adaptive test. It looks at you as an individual. It says, hey, are they answering these questions? Um, and are they too hard or are they too easy for the individual skill level? So let's just say that you happen to answer your first question correctly. Then the next question you get is going to be a little bit more difficult. If you answer it incorrectly, the computer then will select an easier question for you. And it does this throughout the test. It addresses client needs. So every so often, NCSBN goes out and they take a survey of what the work sites look like for registered nurses. And they determine, based upon those results, what are the client's needs. What are the clinical settings where beginning nurses work? What kind of care are you being expected to deliver? What are your primary duties and responsibilities? And based upon uh, that survey, they've come up with these particular areas that will be covered on the test and at different percents. And so, for instance, you can see that farm is actually, pharmacology is actually one of the biggest uh, percentages at 12 to 18. And so just remember that these are, you know, uh, different ranges and that it really is just testing whether you can be defined as entry level nurse. And the various types of questions that could be included on the NCLEX include multiple choice, uh, select all that apply. Just realize that you could have up to six responses. You could have fill in the blank, drop and drag, hotspot, audio, order response, and where, for instance, a procedure procedure you would need to actually place the steps of the procedure in order, or have a chart, have to gain information from the charter exhibit, and answer the question based upon uh, the information in the chart. Just quickly, let's go over the difference between the STEM and your answer choices. You guys can see that the STEM is actually asking the question. And the problem with this is the STEM includes what we call distractors. And so you have to be proficient at getting rid of the distractors and only highlighting or picking out what truly are the most important words. Remember that if a patient's demographics are not provided, then they're not important. Also remember that if a patient's vital signs, for instance, are not included, then they're normal. Or a patient's labs are not included, then they're normal. So when we read through this stem, a patient is being treated for heart failure with diuretic therapy. Which of the following assessments best indicates to the nurse that the patient's condition is improving? then you need to be able to pick out some key words. When looking at this, you might think at first that heart failure is key. And you think diuretic therapy, the word best, and improving. When we relook at this question, we realize that honestly, we just need to know that the patient is receiving diuretic therapy, and we need to know how or which answer choice best shows the patient is improving. So out of this particular stem, we need to identify the fact that the patient's on diuretic therapy and we need to know how they're improving. When you're looking at the answer choices, you know honestly they're all good answer choices and this is how you guys often feel during NCLEX. So you need to pick which one shows improvement. The patient's weight has remained stable since admission. Well, it's good that it's not gone up, but if someone's on diuretic therapy, would we not prefer it to decrease? Weight is an excellent indication 
of the patient's fluid status. The patient's systolic blood pressure has decreased. Again, what has it decreased from? There are fewer crackles heard when auscultating the patient's lungs. We certainly should keep this in the mix because we know that crackles are also um, an indication of fluid status. And the patient's urinary output is 1,500 mLs per day. Well, we honestly don't know what it was before. And so when we look at this, we realize that the best uh, indicator that the patient's condition has improved with diuretic therapy is that there are fewer crackles when auscultating the patient's lungs. You guys are going to have to try different strategies. What's going to help you to become a better test taker? Sometimes rewording the questions, obviously eliminating the incorrect answers. Often you can get it down to two. Don't predict the answers, and with this I would say make sure you read the question entirely. Recognize what they want you to know. Recognize the expected outcome. Read answer choices to obtain clues, and sometimes it is helpful for some students to turn the answer choices into true or false responses, such as, is the response true or is the response false? Do not bring your experience to the test, whether you're currently practicing as a uh, CNA or maybe an LPN. You need to leave your experience in the parking lot. You know, remember, always take care of your patient first and then the equipment. Make sure that you review the RN NCLEX test plan. Realize there are certain lab values that you're expected to know. Memorize this list that's been provided by the NCSBN. Make sure that you understand thoroughly medication administration, that you understand the six rights of giving medication safely. And realize that notifying the MD is rarely the correct answer, that often there is a piece that is missing prior to you notifying the physician. Just some reminders. Critical thinking requires that you observe that you observe what is happening in the question. That again, as we've already said, it is important that you decide what's needed in the STEM. That you look for patterns in relationships, especially in your answer choices. That you're able to identify the problem and the expected outcome. That you can transfer knowledge from one situation to another. So for instance, that you learn enough about perfusion within your nursing program that you could transfer this knowledge from an infant to a pediatric patient, to an adult, to an older patient, that you apply what you've learned, that you evaluate according to established criteria, which we will talk about, and realize that there's different types of questions, such as recall, understanding, application, and analysis, and that the majority of NCLEX questions are written at the application and analysis level. Just a couple of examples of questions. Basic recall would be one in which the question would look like, which of the following is a complication that occurs during the first 24 hours after a percutaneous liver biopsy? Nausea and vomiting, constipation, hemorrhage, or pain at the site? Well, we um, realize that because the liver is vascular, that the answer to this would be hemorrhage. You have to have very little knowledge and just recall to answer this particular question. Then we realize an understanding question would look like the nurse understands that the hemorrhage is a complication of a liver biopsy due to which of the following reasons. So now it is saying, okay, the patient's had a liver biopsy, they're at risk for hemorrhage. Why? So you need to identify hemorrhage, right? You need to understand that they're looking for a complication, okay, from a liver biopsy. So one, there are several large blood vessels near the liver. B, the liver cells are bathed with a mixture of venous and arterial blood. C, the test is performed with patients with elevated enzymes. D, the procedure requires a large piece of tissue to be removed. So you have to look at your answer choices, and you actually have to have an understanding of the anatomy, right, of the liver. So we think back, large, several large blood vessels near the liver, and then this is when you remember, mm, okay, hepatic portal system, 
there was blood supply from the vein, the you know por- hepatic portal vein and arteries. Two, the liver cells are bathed with the mixture of venous and arterial blood. Okay, so you remember that there was vein a, a major vein and artery supplying the blood to the liver. See the test is performed on patients with elevated enzymes. That is not necessarily true. It can be uh, performed on patients who do not have elevated enzymes. And D, the procedure requires a large piece of tissue to be removed. And then you remember from just the general concept of biopsies that it's typically a small piece of tissue. So then that brings you to your understanding that the liver has both venous and arterial blood supply. So read through these questions. And what you're going to think to yourself is, wow, these are much more difficult. And that's true, because they are higher level thinking, application, and analysis. And this is what you guys have to get used to. So when you're reading these particular questions, you want to make sure that you can identify what the question is asking, what are the key words in the stem, and eliminate the incorrect responses. And so as you read through these, what you're going to realize is application is actually wanting you to know now without naming it that the patient is showing signs and symptoms of a hemorrhage. So you have to be able to identify the signs and symptoms of a hemorrhage. And what you realize is honestly B or C are decent choices, you know. So you look at one of the responses and ask yourself which one really is more objective and the answer is C. We remember you know from hemorrhage, hypovolemia, fluid volume deficit, that an increased pulse rate, a decreased blood pressure, and increased respirs can be sign of fluid volume deficit. When you look at the analysis question you have to ask yourself did I learn anything about haloperidol and diet choices. And if you do not remember anything as far as diet choices for a particular drug, then what you're going to want to do is just go back to the basics of nutrition and pick the response which offers the best diet. And so when we're looking through these, it, the best, most uh, common healthy diet would be one with green beans, chicken, a banana, and some milk. Just some things that you guys can read through as far as strategies that work and don't work as far as becoming a successful uh, test taker. Uh, Really understanding what kind of test taker you are and learner you are does help you to be more successful in taking and collect style tests. It's interesting when you read the following statement. A nurse walks into a room and finds the patient lying on the floor. So ask yourself, did you just hear yourself saying the words or did you actually visualize this sentence, visualize the scene? That helps you to understand how you take a test. You want to remember the following on each question. One, I want to reiterate, don't use real world experiences. Two, you're in NCLEX land. You have all the time, the staff, and the equipment that you need. Do not eliminate answer choices based upon not having enough time, not having enough staff, or the correct equipment. Just again, take care of the patient first, and remember, it is the test of your judgment, your judgment that's been deemed as entry-level judgment. You want to look for clues and priority questions, and these are a majority of NCLEX-style questions. Look for words, best, most important, First, your initial response. So for instance, an hour after admission to the nursery, the nurse observes a newborn baby having spontaneous jerky movements of the limbs. The infant's mother had gestational diabetes during pregnancy. Which of the following actions should the nurse take first? So you're actually asking yourself, what should I do first? Should I give dextrose first, call the MD immediately, determine the blood glucose level, or observe closely for other symptoms? And so you think about this question, and you realize that in your mind, you have probably visualized a newborn baby 
having spontaneous jerky movements and you're thinking that they're having seizures. You remember the information that you learned during um, mother baby about mothers who have babies that are just that have gestational diabetes and realize they are at risk for seizing. And then you think, what should I do first? Would you give dextrose blindly without knowing an actual blood sugar? Would you call the MD? If you choose this, what are you going to tell them? Would you determine the blood glucose level so you could assess or verify what you have witnessed? Or would you just monitor closely for other symptoms? So I think you've determined probably that we would want to check the blood glucose level so we could verify that the patient was actually seizing. I know that you guys have learned this along the way, that you want to use Maslow's first. Then typically you want to apply the ABCs, safety, and the nursing process. So you want to look at questions and you want to look at your answer choices and ask yourself, is this a physiological or a psychosocial uh, choice? And you can eliminate the psychosocial answers over the physiological answers. This becomes difficult because oftentimes physiological uh, needs must be addressed first. That's what we are told in Maslow's hierarchy of learning or hierarchy of needs. And pain is actually considered a psychosocial response on your NCLEX. So often treating the pain is not the first answer or the most important step that you would want to take. Then you can apply the ABCs, the nursing process, and safety. These are your next priorities. Remember, assessment, it takes priority over all other steps. Do not implement prior to assessing. Just like the previous question, we cannot give dext dextrose based upon the fact that the child possibly had a seizure. We needed to assess or verify. Remember to compare, and if no data is provided, the patient is normal. Don't read behind the question. Implementation is care provided. Remember, if you have a dependent intervention, one that requires an MD order, and it is listed as an answer choice, you have an order for it. You do not eliminate it based upon the fact that you think, oh, I need a doctor's order for that. You have the order if it is listed as an answer choice. If all answers are implementation, then choose the one that uses safety as a guide. And always ask yourself, what intervention would cause the least amount of harm? Okay, remember to know your positions. Uh, you need to get an NCLEX RN uh, review book. There are essentially several positions that you need to know, and you need to understand what they are trying to prevent or promote. And you need to think about a positioning question and the anatomy and physiology base behind it. And so, for instance, um, one of the therapeutic positions is flat or supine as we know it, right? So what are you trying to do? You're trying to uh, prevent hip flexion, okay, which can uh, compromise like arterial blood flow. So just make sure that you know the various positioning question, uh, <clears throat> questions. Also, you have to understand communication questions and that there's a strategy. There's uh, some that you should use and some you shouldn't, and so we're going to go over the ones that you shouldn't use. So I think you understand you don't uh, use the don't worry responses, so you can eliminate those answer cho choices because they offer false reassurance. So for instance, if you see it says it's going to be okay, or don't worry, your doctors are doing everything they can for you, then you would understand that you would eliminate these. You eliminate explore. So um, this is another incorrect answer choice, okay? So you don't want to use an explore um, response because you don't want to become what we call a junior um, psychiatrist. You also don't want to use the why. 
Why actually seems like it's passing judgment or you disapprove of the client's choice. And so you want to eliminate the why responses. Authoritarian, where it gives the choice or gives the patient no choice, you want to eliminate those. Uh, answer responses that f bring the focus back on the nurse, you need to eliminate, such as that happened to me once or I know from experience. And close-ended questions you want to eliminate or close-ended responses because they don't give the patient an opportunity to express uh, what they're feeling. Uh, such as, are you feeling guilty about what happened? That just offers a yes or no. So you need to think about the communication. You need to think about the goal and the purpose of the communication. Some of the responses that you would want to use would be using silence. That often gives the client time to think about and reflect on what they want to say. Um, you can just use a general uh, broad opening. You certainly can use clarification. It kind of summarizes and you repeat or clarify what you think the client is telling you. And you can use uh, reflecting, which also paraphrases what the client is saying. Okay, so strategies to break down questions. So we uh, need to learn the techniques that you need to follow in order to hopefully answer the questions correctly. We know that we answer them first, or the first strategy would be to answer them with Maslow's. You remember that Maslow's is the pyramid and it has five different areas of need for each human being but they're based upon what's most important and that being physiological. So remember they're at the base physiological then safety and security, love and belonging, self-esteem and self-actualization. So physiological needs are necessary for survival so they're, therefore they're the highest priority and they must be met first. So that's things like, you know, oxygen, nutrition, fluid, temperature, elimination, shelter. And if you don't have, you know, oxygen to breathe or food to eat, then you can't survive. And so these take precedence over psychosocial relationships. Then it goes on to safety and security. These can be both physical and psychosocial, okay? A physical would be what's threatening your client, uh, such as a temperature, a myocardial infarction, uh, someone in a car accident. And then uh, psycho psychological safety, uh, you have to realize that your patient has to have the knowledge and understanding about what to expect from the environment. So it's important. This is where teaching comes in, and it's important um, that they know, for instance, what to expect ac after a CVA. So you want to first look at a question and ask yourself, um, is this a question, and can I establish it based upon Maslow's hierarchy? So look at your responses, eliminate all those responses that are not uh, physiological, and then from physiological, the responses that you have left, you want to apply um, the CAB, okay? So you want to apply what we used to call the ABCs, but now they're the CABs, the circulation, the airway, and breathing. And that would be your first strategy. Your second strategy that you could use, if it's not a question about Maslow's, your second strategy that you could use would be to implement the nursing process. You just need to remember to ask yourself when you're looking at the STEM and you're looking at the res uh, responses or the answer choices, you need to ask yourself, is this a question that is about assessment versus implementation? We know that um, assessment is where we collect the data about the client and we know that this has to take precedence or comes first over implementation. We cannot implement if we do not have sufficient data. So ask yourself, what is the outcome of this question? Is it an assessment versus an implementation question? So <clears throat> assessment must take priority. And then, as we previously have talked about, um, you also want to follow the rules for positioning and the rules for communication. This is a communication question. It is a communication question that is not mental health related. A patient is admitted to the ER with a diagnosis of an MI. The patient tells the nurse, I'm scared. I think I'm going to die. Which of the following responses by the nurse would be most appropriate? A, everything is going to be fine. We will take good care of you. You can eliminate this answer. We just said 
to eliminate don't worry type of responses. B. I know what you mean. I thought I was having a heart attack once. Again, you can eliminate because it focuses on the nurse. C. I will call your doctor so you can discuss it with him. This is a closed-ended question. It does not offer the opportunity for the patient to express any feelings. So that leads us to D. It is normal to feel frightened. We are doing everything we can for you. So the correct response here is D. Okay, this is a communication question. A patient is in a psychiatric unit and asks the nurse, am I in a special radioactive shelter? When was it last checked for radioactivity? Which of the following responses by the nurse would be most appropriate? So we have A, there's, this is a hospital and we do not have a nuclear med department here. It provides information, so let's leave it in the mix. B, don't worry, you're safe, there's no radioactivity here. Provides false reassurance. We're going to get rid of it. C, I'm sure your safety is of concern to you, but this is a hospital. Again, provides information, we're going to leave it in. D, please share with me what makes you think that there is radioactivity here. Well, we do not want to encourage the patient to talk about their hallucinations or delusions. Rather, we need to focus on how they're feeling, so we're going to eliminate D. So it leaves us with A and C. And we look at both of these possible answer choices, and we look for the answer choice that really reflects on feelings and gives information. And why we would pick C over A is the fact that this says nuclear med. This patient's not necessarily going to know what a nuclear med department is, so the correct answer is, I'm sure your safety is of concern to you, but this is a hospital. Okay, this is a positioning question. So when you look at it, you read the nurse cares for a patient after a lumbar laminectomy. Which of the following statements best describes the method of turning a patient following a lumbar laminectomy? So you say to yourself, this is a positioning question. I needed to know <clears throat> the important positions and what to prevent and promote. So this is actually a question about promote. We need to promote good turning for someone who has had a lumbar laminectomy. So you're going to have to remember <clears throat> what a laminectomy is. And so this requires the principles of anatomy and physiology and knowing your positioning. So A, head of the bed is elevated 30 degrees, the patient locks her knees when turning. No, what we remember is from a lumbar laminectomy, we need to keep the back straight. So this is not going to promote a straight back. So this particular question, we can eliminate a response. B, a pillow is placed between the patient's leg. Her body is turned as a unit. This we can leave into consideration. It does promote a straight back. C, the patient straightens her back and grasps the side rail on the opposite side. If you visualize this, then you can realize that this is going to cause a twist in motion and not promote a straight back. You can get rid of it. And D, the head of the bed is flat. The patient bends her knees and rolls to the side. Again, this does not promote a uh, straight back. And so your correct response here is B. Okay, we look at this question. A boy was riding his bike to the school when he hits the curb. The boy tells the school nurse, I think it broke. I think my leg is broken. Which of the following actions is the first action? First action the nurse should take. Okay, and so when we're looking at this, what we realize is that this is question that we're going to need to utilize the nursing process. And so what did we say about the nursing process? We need to assess before we implement because the statement, I think my leg is broken, is not our assessment. So do we want to immobilize the affected limb with a split and ask the patient not to move it? No, that is implementation. Ask the patient to explain <clears throat> what happened. Now that is an assessment. Let's leave it in the mix. 
C, put the patient in a semi-phalage position to facilitate breathing. Again, that is implementation. D, check the appearance of the patient's leg. That's assessment. So we have B and D are both assessments. What would take priority, though? That's what you have to ask yourself. Would it be what the boy said happened, or would you need to assess the appearance of the leg? So that's what your question is. So what takes priority? And what takes priority is our assessment over what the young man has said happened. So it is check the appearance of the patient's leg, and then you would ask him to explain what happened. Okay, question five. A patient is submitted with the diagnosis of dementia. He attempts to several times to pull out his NG tube in order for cloth wrist restraints is received by the nurse. Which of the following actions by the nurse is most appropriate? So this is actually a question about safety. We want to follow the nursing process. We look at these, attach, perform, remove, and explain. You realize that they are all implementation, so initially you keep them all in and you think about which one of these will cause the least amount of harm. Okay, So we read A, attach the ties of the restraints to the bed frame. That's implementation. We can keep it in because that does promote safety. B, perform range of motion to the restrained extremities once a shift. That is implementation. It promotes safety, but what we realize with this particular response is once a shift is not enough, so we would eliminate this particular response. C, remove the restraints when the patient is up in a wheelchair. Um, this is not a, an appropriate implementation because the patient is confused and therefore should have their restraints applied even when they're in the wheelchair. We eliminate this response. And then explain the need for restraints only to the family because the patient is confused. And while, yes, we do need to explain it to the patient's family, even though the patient is confused, we still need to explain it to them. And so we would eliminate that response, and the correct answer would be attach the ties to the restraints of the bed frame. Okay, question six. The nurse plans care for a 14-year-old girl admitted with an eating disorder. On admission, the girl weighs 82 pounds, and she's 5'4". Lab test indicates severe hypokalemia, anemia, and dehydration. And the nurse should give which of the following nursing diagnoses the highest priority. So... <clears throat> This is a question of Maslow's hierarchy, remembering that on the bottom is the physiological needs take priority. So we look at A, body image disturbance related to weight loss. We know that that is a psychosocial diagnosis, so we can eliminate it. Then we look at self-esteem disturb, self -esteem disturbance related to feelings of inadequacy. Once again, it is a psychosocial, so we can eliminate it. Then we have altered nutrition, less than body requirements related to decreased intake. That is a physiological. We can keep it. And D, decreased cardiac output related to the potential for dysrhythmias. And that, again, is a physiological, so we can keep it. So then you go to what? You go to the cab, circulation, airway, and breathing. And it becomes clear that decreased cardiac output related to potential for dysrhythmias based upon the fact that she has hypokalemia uh, would be a circulation based response and so it would take precedence over C. So we would eliminate C and keep D. Okay, seven. A woman is admitted to the hospital with a ruptured atopic pregnancy. A laparotomy is scheduled. Pre-op, which of the following goes is most important for the nurse to include in the patient's plan of care? We have fluid replacement, pain relief, emotional support, and respiratory therapy. Again, we're looking at Maslow's, right? So when we look at these, fluid replacements is a physiological response. Let's keep it. Pain relief is not. We're going to eliminate it. <clears throat> Emotional support is not. We're going to eliminate it. And respiratory therapy is a physiological. So we have fluid replacement and respiratory therapy. And we go back to what we remembered about ruptured atopic pregnancies. The fact that that particular patient can become hypovolemic because they're bleeding. It is a surgical emergency, and we realize applying the CAB, circulation, airway, and breathing, that we need to be concerned with this patient's circulation. And so the correct response is fluid replacement. All right. A patient is admitted from the ED with a diagnosis of influenza and respiratory failure. Which nursing intervention is top priority for implementation? 
And so it tells you right up its implementation. And so we know that there, if there would happen to be an assessment response, that we would eliminate it. So we say where appropriate PPE, that's uh, implementation. Let's keep that. Sounds good. Don a face mask prior to entering patient's room. Hmm, that sounds good. Let's keep it. Strict hand hygiene. That sounds good. Let's keep it. And initiate droplet precautions. Wow, that sounds good. Let's keep it. So we have to ask ourselves which one of these responses actually should be implemented first. Okay, so it is asking you top priority. How are we going to keep everyone safe? And so we know when we look at that, top priority, safety for everyone, we want to initially, once the patient gets on the floors, make sure that we initiate droplet precautions so everybody understands that we're dealing with the case of the flu. Okay, that wraps up our NCLEX test-taking strategies. Um, thank you for listening. If you have any questions, be sure to reach out to me. If you're one of my current students, you know how to get a hold of me. If you're not and you would like to have uh, one, this PowerPoint or one of the PowerPoints on my website, just remember that you can go to nurse.poly.rn at gmail. Thanks for stopping by.